Now in our 25th year, a quarter of a century of service to the worldwide amateur radio community, we are this week in amateur radio. Your all amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is edition number 1323 with a release and air date of Saturday, July 6, 2024. Please take the program to your air following the Q-Tone. On the air around the world on the amateur radio bands, and streaming on the internet since 1993, serving the amateur radio community with weekly, reliable, amateur radio news and special features, we are This Week in Amateur Radio. The worldwide premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1323 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The ARRL issues a call for nominations for both ARRL director and vice director positions. We will have team coverage. ARRL's logbook of the world has returned to service after an extended absence. The new extra class question pool has been released. We will have all the details. Ham Radio, the largest ham fest held in Europe, was a big success this year in Friedrichshafen, Germany. The Hurricane Watch Net activates for Hurricane Barrel. The ARRL VEC services has an update post cyber attack. Amateurs in Germany are granted remote access privileges, while the DARC is considering building remote stations around Germany. New ARRL section managers are announced. We will introduce you to them. The ARRL and Italian antenna manufacturer MamaBeam are offering a new beam antenna for 6 and 10 meters. The ARRL club grant program deadline is coming up soon. The United States Congress may mandate AM radio in cars. The car manufacturer's response will surprise you. SpaceX successfully launches the new Gozu weather satellite and gets hired by NASA to build a craft to deorbit the International Space Station. And two Lithuanian American aviators are remembered in an upcoming special event station. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, and Foundations of Amateur Radio will talk about the International Amateur Radio Union and what its function is on the world stage. We will have the weekly propagation forecast brought to us by Tad Cook, K2RA in Seattle. Our own amateur radio historian, Will Rogers, K5WLR, will be here with more of the history of amateur radio. Will returns with another edition of A Century of Amateur Radio. This week, Will goes back to the days of the spark gap with an article entitled The Squeak Box, where we find that among preteens, mostly boys took to radio. And, we will stop by and visit with Bill Salliers, AJ8B with all the latest news on radio sport, D expeditions, DX, upcoming contests, and more. That's all straight ahead is North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters vast studio facility just outside of Albany, New York, this is W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in Salem, Ohio, with the sounds of freedom celebrations still ringing in our ears, this is Denny Haight, NZ8D. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, and enjoying this Independence Holiday weekend, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our news bureau in the shadow of the Great Smoky Mountains, where the mountains just became a little more smokier, I'm Josh Marler, AA4WX. And reporting from our Troy, New York news bureau, where this week the wild berry bushes ripened, I'm Eric. KD2, RJX. And reporting from our Catskill Mountain outpost in upstate New York, where the sweet corn might be ready sometime this week, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where someone has set the thermostat to broil, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Denny Haight, NZAD. Full ARRL members in the Central, Hudson, New England, Northwestern, and Roanoke divisions have the opportunity to choose a director and vice director to represent you for a three-year term beginning January 1, 2025. ARRL is governed by its board of directors, 
A voting director is chosen by ballot by the full licensed ARRL members in each of its 15 divisions. Vice directors who serve in the absence of the director at a board meeting and succeed to the position of director should a vacancy occur are chosen at the same time. Elections are held in five divisions per year. It takes only 10 full members in a division to nominate a candidate for either office. Here are the qualifications. The eligibility of nominees for the positions of ARRL director and vice director will be reviewed by the Ethics and Elections Committee, composed of three directors not subject to election this year. They are Mickey Baker, N4MB, Jeff Ryan, K0RM, and Scott Yonnelly, N8SY. A nominee must be at least 21 years old and must have been licensed and a full member of the ARRL for a continuous term of at least four years immediately preceding nomination. Each nominee must provide information concerning their employment, ownership, investment interests, and other financial arrangements to ensure compliance with the conflict of interest policy available at www.arrl.org forward slash general dash information. The qualifications for director and vice director are identical. All the powers of the director are transferred to the vice director in the event of the director's resignation, recall, removal outside the division, inability to serve, or death. Here is the nomination procedure. Step 1. Obtain official nominating petition forms. Starting July 1st, any full member residing in a division where there is an election may request an official nominating petition package in writing, either by letter or via email, to execadmin, that's one word, E-X-E-C-A-D-M-I-N, at ARRL.org. The request must reach the ARRL secretary no later than noon Eastern Daylight Time on Friday, August 9th, 2024. If you are seriously considering running or nominating someone to run, please don't wait until the last minute to request the forms. The deadline for submitting a completed petition form is just one week later. Step 2. Complete the questionnaire and obtain signatures. Only the official form may be used. The candidate must complete page 1, providing the information required to determine eligibility, certifying its accuracy, and agreeing to assume the office if elected. To be valid, a nominating petition must name the candidate and must bear the signatures of 10 full members of the division. Step 3. Submit the petition form. The completed form must reach the Secretary no later than noon Eastern Daylight Time on Friday, August 16, 2024. The submission may be made by electronic transmission of images or facsimile provided that upon request, the original documents are received by the Secretary within seven days of the request. A person who is nominated for both Director and Vice Director may choose to decline the nomination for Director, otherwise the nomination for Director will stand and that for Vice Director will be void. On Monday, August 19th, 2024, the Secretary will notify each candidate of the name and call sign of each other candidate for the same office. Candidates will then have until Friday, August 30th, 2024, to submit a 300-word statement and a photograph if they desire those to be made available to voters in accordance with instructions that will be supplied. With more information, we go to our own Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. Here is how the balloting works. If there is only one eligible candidate for an office, he or she will be declared elected by the Ethics and Elections Committee. If there is more than one eligible candidate for an office, the full members in that division who are in good standing as of September 10, 2024, will have the opportunity to cast ballots. Official voting documents will be mailed to members who are eligible to vote no later than October 1, 2024. Votes must be electronically cast or completed paper ballots must be received at the designated P.O. Box in the envelope provided by noon Eastern Time on Friday, November 15, 2024. The candidate receiving the most votes will be declared the winner that day. For absentee ballots, a full member who is residing temporarily outside his or her home division, including overseas, may arrange to vote in the home division by notifying the secretary before September 6, 2024, giving their current mailing address as reflected in the ARRL membership records and the reason that another division is considered home. Members with overseas military addresses should take special note of this provision. In the absence of information received to the contrary, ballots will be sent to them based on their postal addresses. 
The incumbent directors and vice directors, respectively, in the five divisions in which elections will be held this year are in the central division, Carl Lutzel Schwab, K9LA director, and Brent Walls, N9BA vice director. In the Hudson division, Nomar Viscarando, NP4H director, and Ed Wilson, N2XDD vice director. In the New England division, Fred Kemmerer, AB1OC Director, and Phil Temples, K9HI Vice Director. In the Northwestern Division, Mark J. Tharp, KB7HDX Director, and Michael Sturba, KG7HQ Vice Director. In the Roanoke Division, Jim Boehner, N2ZZ Director, and Bill Marine, N2COP Vice Director. And finally, for the Board of Directors, David A. Minster, NA2AA, Secretary and Chief Executive Officer. Now celebrating our 25th year keeping the amateur radio community around the world informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at TWIAR.net. AWRL Logbook of the World, LOTW, returned to service on July 1, 2024. It had been offline as part of a system service disruption. As work progressed on the network, some users encountered LOTW opening briefly, during which some 6,600 logs were uploaded. The logs were not processed until this weekend, as we tested that the interfaces to LOTW were functioning properly. In announcing the logbook's restoration on the 1st of July in a letter to members, the AWRL gave no insights into the direct cause of the outage and offered no details of any additional security being put into place to protect against future hacking. We are taking steps to help manage what will be likely a huge influx of logs. We are requesting that if you have large uploads, perhaps from contest or from a de-expedition, Please wait a week or two before uploading to give LOTW a chance to catch up. We have also implemented a process to reject logs with excessive duplicates. Please do not upload your entire log to ensure your contacts are in LOTW as they will be rejected. Despite this request, we have seen several recent de-expeditions upload large log files, and many amateurs have uploaded logs with excessive duplicates. This negatively impacts the backlog time. Lastly, please do not call the AWRL headquarters to report issues you are having with LOTW. You can contact support at lotw-help at awrl.org. Through the end of the year, you may experience planned times when LOTW will be unavailable. We have been using this time to evaluate operational and infrastructure improvements we would like to make to LOTW. Those times will be announced. We appreciate your patience as we work through the challenges keeping LOTW from returning to service. We know the importance of LOTW to our members and to the tens of thousands of LOTW users who are not AWRL members. LOTW, just behind QST, is the second most popular AWRL benefit. ARRL, the new amateur extra class question pool has been released and is effective as of July 1. The new question pool is in effect through June 30th of 2028. With all the details on the question pool, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, with more. The 2024-2028 pool is available as a Microsoft Word document and as a PDF. The 10 graphics required for the new Extra Class Question Pool are available within the documents or separately in PDF and JPEG file formats. The new pool incorporates significant changes compared to the 2020-2024 version, said ARRL Volunteer Examiner Coordinator VEC Maria Soma, AB1FM. We carefully went over the pool for technical accuracy, relevance to today's amateur radio practices, syntax, grammar, style, format, and clarity, and redundancy within and between the pools. With those goals in mind, 82 new questions were created and 101 questions were eliminated, resulting in a reduction of the total number of questions from 622 to 603. 
Over 350 questions were modified. We considered a question modified when the knowledge being tested was not changed, but wording was improved or answers or distractions were replaced. Some advised that the newly revised pool must be used for extra class license exam that started on July 1st, 2024. Exam designs based on the previous pool are no longer valid, and outdated versions of the extra exam should be destroyed or thrown away to avoid a mix-up at the testing session. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. The ARL VEC had planned to supply its officially appointed field stocked VE team leaders with a new extra class exam booklet designs around mid-June. But due to the ARRL's recent system disruption, that date is now to be determined. Supplies will be sent as soon as possible. In the interim, VE teams may contact ARRL's VEC to receive instructions on how to print the new extra exams. This is the July 2024 Volunteer Monitor Program Report. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between ARRL and the FCC to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. Two operators in Virginia and Florida received advisory notices concerning wideband operation of 6 to 7 kHz wide on 40 meters, contrary to FCC rules. Section 97.307 subpart A provides that, no amateur shall occupy more bandwidth than necessary for the information rate and emission type being transmitted, in accordance with good amateur practice. A GMRS operator received an advisory notice for operating on an amateur repeater in Tennessee after being requested by the repeater owner to stay off the repeater. Any further operation will be referred to the FCC. An operator in South Carolina received a commendation for activities on the Grand Strand Amateur Radio Club repeater operating on 147.100 and 441.775 MHz. The operator participated as net control for the first time, on short notice, and managed all check-ins in a timely and efficient manner. An operator in Louisiana received an advisory notice for operation with an expired license. Technician class operators in Indiana, Idaho, and Mississippi received advisory notices for operating FT8 on 40 meters. Technicians may operate only CW on 40 meters. An operator in Maine received an advisory notice for failure to identify during an hour-long transmission on 75 meters. Section 97.119 subpart A requires amateur stations to transmit the assigned call sign at the end of each communication and at least every 10 minutes during a communication. A glider pilot club in Claremont, Florida, received an advisory notice for operation on amateur frequencies without a license. Any further operation will be referred to the FCC. The FCC issued a notice of unlicensed operation to a skydiving organization in Lake Elsinore, California. The organization must cease operation and respond to the FCC within 30 days. An electric cooperative power company in Arkansas received an advisory notice due to unlicensed operation on 145.500 MHz by its fiber optics contractor. This month, there was one meeting with the FCC. A volunteer monitor program presentation was given at the 2024 Dayton Hamvention. The monitoring totals for this month were 1,166 hours on HF frequencies and 1,046 hours on VHF frequencies and above, for a total of 2,212 hours. We thank volunteer monitor coordinator Riley Hollingsworth for this month's report. Now is the time to gather your club members and start thinking about how you can make your community a better place through amateur radio and the league has funding available to help. John Ross, KD8IDJ, is here with the details. The ARRL Foundation is pleased to announce the return of the club grant program for 2024. This is an opportunity for clubs to apply for grants of up to $25,000 to fund projects in their communities. With emphasis given to projects that are of a transformational nature, consider applying today to support a project or activity for which your club and community would benefit. Can your club create a plan to improve the community through education, recruiting, training, and promotion of amateur radio? This is for you if it is. The application period is now open and runs through Friday, July 26, 2024 at 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Club across the country are encouraged to apply even if your club is not an ARRL-affiliated club or not a 501c3 organization. All are welcome to apply. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Consider applying today to support a project or activity from which your club and community would benefit. Can your club create a plan to improve the community through education and training in, recruiting for, and promotion of amateur radio? 
This is for you. The application period is now open and runs through Friday, July 26, 2024 at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Clubs across the country are encouraged to apply, even if your club is not an ARRL-affiliated club or not a 501c3 organization, all are welcome to apply. Grant recipients will be required to share progress reports and updates with ARRL information about the club grant program can be found at www.arrl.org slash club dash grant dash program. Again, the submission deadline, July 26, 2024. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, has a new product to help radio amateurs get active and on the air. With all the details on this exciting new product, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, at League Headquarters. As Solar Cycle 25 continues to increase HF propagation on the upper bands, ARRL has partnered with the Italian antenna manufacturer Mamo Beam to design a dual-band beam antenna to help take full advantage of the exciting opportunities for distant contacts. The ARRL Dual Beam Mamo Band 610 antenna is an easy-to-use antenna with a small footprint and a big reach. The beam features a 10-meter Moxon 28 MHz and a 6-meter Yangi 50 MHz. At just over 10 pounds and with a turning radius of approximately 6.5 feet, the design is compact enough to fit places that otherwise wouldn't have space for a beam antenna. It comes with two sets of hardware for both permanent installation and portable use for temporary deployments like 2024 ARRL Field Day or park activations. The ARRL Dual Band Mambo Beam 610 antenna is ideal for technician class operators to be able to work DX. This is a great first beam antenna for every ham, said ARR Director of Marketing and Innovation Bob Interbitson, NQ1R. If you've ever been intimidated by the prospect of owning a beam antenna, this one will allay your fears and give you a whole lot of fun. Radio clubs will want to add this beam to their deployment gear, as it's a great fit for field operating and special event stations. College radio clubs that don't have room for a large beam or other beam will enjoy adding this antenna for some gain on 6 and 10 meters. It is lightweight and can be turned with a simple TV rotor. The antenna debuted at the 2024 ARRL National Convention hosted by Dayton Hamvention in May. The first run sold out at the show, but ARRL has taken delivery of more units and they are available now. You can read more about the new antenna and how to order it at ARRL.org. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. The 10-meter Moxon is an effective design for this dual-band antenna as it's around 30% smaller than a traditional Yagi and uses no traps or other shortening techniques that reduce performance. A Moxon antenna includes a number of antenna configurations that were referred to by Les Moxon, G6XN, and have received attention over the years in QST and editions of the ARRL antenna book. The feed system uses an open-sleeve feed method, coupling the driven element of the 50 MHz section by proximity and a length to the 10-meter driven element with minimal loss. Just attach a single coaxial cable to the included SO239 equipped coaxial pigtail, and you're ready to go on two bands, said Inderbitson. It's surprising how few amateurs have experience with antennas beyond basic wire designs, said Inderbitson. Our interest in introducing this antenna is to increase the depth and breadth of knowledge and experience among our members. Inderbitson added that members should watch for more content, including video tutorials coming from ARRL about the antenna. More information about the antenna can be found at www.arrl.org forward slash beam, where future content will also be published. While this antenna was produced exclusively for ARRL, Momo Bean offers many of its popular antenna designs in the United States through its partnership with Ham Radio Outlet. The ARRL Dual Band Momo Beam 6 and 10 antenna is available from the ARRL store. Southern Germany welcomed thousands of amateur radio operators to Europe's biggest gathering of amateurs. The ham radio event in Friedrichshafen ran calmly last weekend over three sunny days on the shores of Lake Constance in southern Germany. 
As usual, Europe's biggest ham gathering welcomed around 13,000 paying attendees from all over the world to the world-class facilities of the new mess. Three of the 13 Zeppelin-sized halls held traders, exhibitors, and flea markets. In the conference center, presentation streams ran and private international amateur radio union meetings with national societies took place. ICOM, Yezu, and JVC Kenwood were there, and Flex and Elecraft had joint stands with their European distributors. There were no new radios announced at the show, but from talking to these companies, it seems that the parts shortages that they and smaller companies have faced is now becoming a thing of the past. The national regulator B. Ned Zah ran license exams for the three classes of the German amateur radio license, including the new entry-level Class N as in Nancy, and were happy to give regulations advice to all. For those living in Germany, a new feature was a job market with representation from several high-tech companies hoping to find skilled people. Friedrichshafen wouldn't be Friedrichshafen without food and drinks as well as the large outside beer garden serving traditional pork and chicken dishes and the best beer in the world. Inside there were a canteen for a variety of snacks and meals and several ice cream and cake vendors for dessert. Hurricane Barrel came ashore this week and the Hurricane Watch Net was activated. Here with an update on the storm and its impact is John Ross, KD8IDJ, reporting from League Headquarters. The first hurricane of the season continues to move across the Caribbean Sea late Thursday, pushing towards the Yucatan Peninsula and the Gulf of Mexico. What had been the earliest storm to develop into a Category 5 hurricane in the Atlantic weakened to a Category 2 hurricane Thursday afternoon. At 2 p.m. Thursday, the storm center was 135 miles west of Grand Cayman, and it had a maximum sustained winds of 110 miles per hour and was moving northwest at 18 miles per hour. The system is expected to weaken gradually as it approaches the Yucatan Peninsula and landfall early Friday morning south of Cozumel as a Category 1 hurricane. The VOIP hurricane net secured operations on Wednesday, July 3rd, Eastern Daylight Time, and the net will be active again on Friday morning, July 5th, as barrel impacts the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico and Belize. The final VOIP hurricane net activation for barrel will likely be Sunday into Monday morning for potential landfall as a hurricane in northeast Mexico and southeast Texas. Amateur radio operators have been active for the past week, receiving and passing information about damage and important needs of those in impacted areas. And there will be more updates that needed at ARRL.org. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. ARRL Director of Emergency Management, Josh Johnston, KE5MHV, reminded amateurs it's important to be ready to help. Johnston said that now is the time to make sure you are prepared individually and as a group. Touch base with your partner agencies. As NOAA has predicted the potential for a busier hurricane year, know your plan. We will all be watching and staying connected with officials in the coastal regions of the country. Amateur radio still has a very important role during times of crisis, and as we have seen in the past, hurricanes can test a community's preparedness more than any other disasters. ARRL previously reported that we are responding to a serious incident involving access to our network and headquarters base systems. Several services have been affected, including those administered by the ARRL Volunteer Examiner Coordinator. Exam Registrations and Materials ARRL Volunteer Examiners should continue to submit exam registrations and material requests. While we are unable to post new or revised exam session dates and details to the website, we can ship out exam materials. Please remember that most exam materials are available on our website. Processing Applications to the FCC We are processing amateur radio license applications to the FCC. This includes applications for new and upgrade licenses, individual applications, and club license applications. The VEC exam session upload webpage was not affected by the incident. The VE session counts webpage data entry programming has been unavailable since May 12th. It will be updated with new data as soon as we are able. VE accreditations, international radio permits, and license class certificates. We are currently unable to create international amateur radio permits, license class certificates, and volunteer examiner badges, certificates, and stickers. 
New ARRL VE applications and renewals are unable to be processed at this time. 2024 through 2028 extra class exam booklets. A previous version of this story indicated that the ARRL VEC will supply its officially appointed field stocked VE team leaders with the new extra class exam booklet designs around mid June. Due to ARRL's recent system disruption, that date is now to be determined. Supplies will be sent as soon as possible. VE teams may contact the ARRL VEC to receive instructions on how to print new extra exams in the interim. The newly revised pool must be used for extra class license exams starting July 1, 2024. Exam designs based off the previous pool are no longer valid. The outdated versions of the extra exams should be destroyed or thrown away to avoid a mix-up at the testing session. ARRL Youth Licensing Grant Program and FCC Application Fee Reimbursement Information ARRL is continuing to accept reimbursement forms to cover the one-time $35 application fee for new licensed candidates younger than 18 years of age for tests administered under the auspices of the ARRL VEC. Reimbursement checks may take longer than normal to be processed at this time. We appreciate your patience as ARRL continues to work on restoring access to affected systems and services. Proud to be among the very first podcasts on the Internet, you are listening to the weekly Amateur Radio News and Bulletin service this week in Amateur Radio. Nominations for the 2024 ARRL section managers have been made. All nominees listed ran unopposed and returned their nomination forms by June 7th. They've been notified by mail and elected for new terms beginning October 1, 2024. In Connecticut, Douglas Sharanovich, WA1SFH. In Idaho, Dan Marler, K7REX. In Minnesota, Bill Mitchell, AE0EE. North Dakota, Ralph Fettig, N0RDF. In Ohio, it's Thomas Sly, WB8LCD. In Oklahoma, Mark Klein, N5HZR. In Puerto Rico, Carmen N. Green Rodriguez, KP4QVQ. In Southern Florida, it's Barry Porter, KB1PA. In the Virgin Islands, Fred Kleber, K9VV. In Western New York, Scott J. Bauer, W2LC. In South Carolina, Matthew Crook, W1MRC, is the new section manager as of July 1. The current section manager, John Gedron, NJ4Z, is moving out of the section. There are now two new section managers, both in the San Joaquin Valley and San Diego sections. In the San Joaquin Valley section, Stephen Hendricks, KK6JTB, is the new section manager as of April 24. Replacing outgoing section manager John Litz, NZ6Q. In the San Diego section, Bruce Crypton, AG6X, was appointed section manager on June 7th, replacing Dave Kaltenborn, N8KBC, who became a silent key in late May. A long standing member service, the AMSAT Mail Alias Service, is scheduled to end on August 1st, 2024. A mail alias, AMSAT.org, permitted people to send email to members without knowing their actual internet email address. They just needed to know their amateur radio call sign. Unfortunately, the unchecked rise in domain name hacking and email account hijacking has made it impossible to sustain this service at a cost-effective level. The number of call sign at amsat.org email accounts that had been hijacked and converted to zombie spam accounts over the years had led many internet service providers and gateway centers to ban all at amsat.org email addresses, including those business accounts of AMSAT officers and officials. The tireless efforts of AMSAT's all-volunteer IT staff has worked for years to repair much of the damage, but AMSAT still gets complaints from members who are not getting their personal emails, ANS bulletins, 
or AMSAT BB post because of persistent delivery problems. It has come to the point where AMSAT volunteer IT staff can no longer keep up with the maintenance requirements to keep the alias mail list clean and to work with email gateways to remove blocks. And after considerable investigation into alternative paid email services, AMSAT leadership decided that the money required to keep an email alias system alive would be better spent on building and flying satellites for its members. Persons using the mail alias service should begin to migrate to different email accounts so they don't lose receipt of personal emails, AMSAT news service weekly bulletins, AMSAT BB post, or official messages from AMSAT itself. Members are especially asked to make sure they are not using a call sign at amsat.org as their registered email address in the AMSAT membership portal. Members can easily change their registered member email address by logging into the portal and updating their profile. June 24th will see the much-anticipated changes for some hams. Revisions to the Amateur Radio Ordinance take effect, granting simplified remote operating privileges to holders of a Class A license. The ability to operate remotely has been a sought-after opportunity for many hams who want to stay active on the air but are not permitted to install antennas at their residence or suffer from a significant amount of electromagnetic interference there. A project being undertaken by the DARC, Germany's National Amateur Radio Organization, is bringing remote operation home, so to speak, by building a network of remote stations around the country that will be accessible to Class A hams in these situations. The development of the stations was funded from DARC and membership funds. Four meter privileges in Germany are extended until the end of 2024. That's good news for hams in Germany who have been enjoying part of the four meter band on a temporary basis. German regulators have extended the privilege through to the end of the year for Class A license holders. Operation on four meters requires the use of horizontally polarized antennas and no more than 25 watts ERP from a fixed station location. Transmissions may occupy a bandwidth of no more than 12 kHz, and remote transmissions are prohibited. Use of the 4-meter band has been slowly expanding in some European countries. The German regulator began issuing temporary privileges for 4 meters back in 2014. The Federal Communications Commission proposed a new rule Thursday that would require carriers to make cell phones unlockable within 60 days of purchase. The move would give cell phone users freedom to take their existing phones and switch from one mobile wireless service provider to another more easily, as long as the consumer's phone is compatible with the new provider's wireless network, the FCC said in a statement. Currently, most cell phones can't be unlocked from a carrier until the contract is up or the phone is paid off, preventing consumers from using the phone on another network. The agency said some cell phones may contain software that prevents them from being used on different mobile networks, even when those networks are technologically compatible. This software essentially locks the phone to another provider's network, keeping users under the thumb of the carriers, the FCC said. Mobile phone unlocking would increase consumer choice and competition in the wireless service provider marketplace. Real competition benefits from transparency and consistency, FCC Chair Jessica Rosenworcel said in a statement. That is why we are proposing clear nationwide mobile phone unlocking rules. When you buy a phone, you should have the freedom to decide when to change service to the carrier you want and not have the device you own stuck by practices that prevent you from making that choice. The new rule would increase competition by reducing consumer switching cost and reduce customer confusion by applying the same unlocking rules to all mobile service providers, the agency noted. The rule does not address how current users would fare under the new rule, but under its notice of proposed rulemaking, the agency is seeking comment on the proposal. The proceeding would also seek comment on whether an unlocking requirement should be applied to existing contracts or future contracts. The agency said it's also looking for comment on the impact of a 60-day unlocking requirement in connection with carrier's incentive 
to offer discounted phones for postpaid and prepaid service plans, and whether the requirement would benefit smaller providers, new entrants, and resellers. The nomination period for the 2024 AMSAT Board of Directors election ended on June 15th. The following candidates have been duly nominated. Mark Hammond, N8MH. Frank Karnaskas, N1UW. Bruce Page, KK5DO. Paul Stotzer, N8HM. And Douglas Tabor, N6UA. All three seats on the Board of Directors are up for election this year. The three candidates receiving the largest number of votes shall be declared elected to the seats. The two candidates receiving the next largest number of votes shall be declared first alternate and second alternate, respectively. The voting process will be conducted via AMSAT's Wild Apricot membership system and will commence on June 15th. Instructions for voting will be emailed to all members in good standing between July 1st and 15th. The voting period shall conclude on September 15th and results will be announced no later than September 30th. Biographies of the candidates will be available for review online and published in the next edition of the AMSAT Journal. Coming up next, This Week in Amateur Radio is presenting another chapter of A Century of Amateur Radio, Hams, Organizations, Events, Inventions, from the mind of Chris Cordella, W2PA, and his editing team. Each episode will bring a different aspect of early amateur radio history. Coming up right after station identification, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. You are listening to North America's premier news and information service for the amateur radio hobbyist. We are This Week in Amateur Radio. Welcome to our new segment here on This Week in Amateur Radio titled Ham Radio History, A Century of Amateur Radio, Hams, Organizations, Events, Inventions. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. Chris Cadella, W2PA, has an excellent website with the same title. We want to thank him for permitting us to use his work here in these programs. So enjoy this, the second of many chapters of Ham Radio History. The squeak box, kids with keys. Among preteens, mostly boys, took to ham radio. At its simplest form, radio was affordable. Boys could buy or make parts to build simple receivers and even low-power spark transmitters. Typically, a kid would hook together a crystal receiver using a metallic mineral such as galena, scraps of used wire, and a set of headphones, perhaps the most expensive component. This basic receiver was not much more than a rock, some wire, and a telephone receiver. But it was magic. A radio receiver that required no battery, no AC power, no power at all except for the energy of the received radio signals themselves. Transmitting was only a little more complicated. An old automobile spark coil, dry cell battery, fixed spark gap, and key constituted a simple spark transmitter albeit a broad, noisy, untuned one. With a setup like this, a kid could communicate with his friends over several city blocks. As this became wildly popular, it was also the bane of the serious urban ham trying to work long distances. A kid using a squeak box, as the simple spark coil transmitter was called, could easily cover up weak signals coming from the next call district or further away. Even today, many hams have experienced the situation when, straining to hear a weak CW signal from far away, a relatively strong station begins transmitting just as the weak, distant one is about to send a call sign or signal report or other piece of information crucial to making a complete contact. Imagine doing this with a broad bandwidth receiver and coarse tuning or none at all. Marconi's experiments with wireless ignited the imagination of a particular 11-year-old boy in Mount Vernon, New York, like nothing else ever had. The morning papers on 14 December 1901 reported the latest thrill. A transmitter in Cornwall, England had just been heard in Newfoundland by the great man himself using a wire suspending from a kite. 
For young Irving Vermilia and thousands of his contemporaries, however, transmitting signals across ever greater distances was not what grabbed them. Although exciting, it took engineering skill and financial backing to build powerful transmitters. But even a kid from Mount Vernon could receive radio signals with some wire and a few relatively inexpensive parts. He knew he absolutely had to be a part of it and pleaded with his two main authorities, his father and the family minister, to help him not just get information and equipment, but to meet Marconi. Reverend C. H. Tyndall, pastor of the Mount Vernon Reformed Church, was not a typical clergyman. Drawn to wireless himself, he had closely followed Marconi's work and often talked about it to his congregation. This was unusual enough to warrant column space in the New York Times, which announced his sermon, Wireless Telegraphy and Its Spiritual Similitudes, to be delivered on 19 May, complete with a live demonstration. When interviewed, however, Reverend Tyndall said he saw nothing remarkable about the event at all, despite the press interest. A few months later, Tyndall had not only met Marconi, he had been given a code key, a coherer, and plans and documents on how to use them, all of which he shared with the boy from his congregation. Backed with some cash from Dad, Irving bought 150 feet of wire from J.H. Bunnell in New York City. A long-established source of telegraphy equipment, Bunnell probably had seen few, if any, customers show up looking for wireless supplies at this point. Using a crude, uninsulated multi-wire antenna on a wooden frame and following Marconi's instructions, Irving assembled a receiving station. Excited and overconfident, he invited all his neighbors in to witness his reception of Marconi's signals. Without tuning ability, a technology yet to be widely adopted, adjusting the length of the antenna wire was the only way to select a wavelength. Most large transmitters at this time operated at wavelengths in the neighborhood of 10,000 meters, a frequency of 30,000 cycles per second as expressed at that time and in units of hertz many years later. Since his antenna was only 12 feet long, he heard nothing. His embarrassing failure was quite public. Over the course of several hours of silence, his audience went from commenting how wonderful it was and what a bright boy Irving is to... I don't believe there is any such thing as wireless telegraphy. Undeterred, Vermilia and a group of friends hooked up a private telegraph line between their houses powered by batteries in his basement and used this system to converse in code and hone their skills. As they built their network, they reached a point with 36 stations in the loop where the batteries were just not sufficient to power it all. To satisfy the new demand, he secretly tapped into the power mains atop a telephone pole, hiding the connection from everyone including most of his telegraph group, which included his cousin, the city electrician. Two years later, with a proper, much longer antenna and some new equipment supplied once again by his minister, Vermilia began to hear signals from the Marconi stations and some ships but having never learned and used continental morse in his local group, he could not understand what they were sending. In 1904, there were, as yet, only a few amateurs, if any, transmitting signals. As the years went by, one by one, new acquaintances began to show up on the air, each using a two-letter identifier called a sign. Irving's was VN, probably short for Van, his nickname. A friendly competition with another enthusiast, George Cannon, located a few blocks away in Mount Vernon, escalated in stages until both of them are operating 5 kW spark stations. VN's setup consisted of a Clap Eastman transformer pulling 53 amps from the 110-volt power line and a home-built rotary spark gap driven by a 250-volt DC motor, which, he claimed, he just hurried along a bit by putting 550 volts on it, which somehow or another mysteriously leaked off a trolley wire into my radio shack. 
The two amateurs started a war of sorts with the operators at the Brooklyn Naval Yard using sign PT and the United Wireless Commercial Station sign NY in New York vying for time on the airwaves. No regulations yet existed to give priority to anyone in particular. Hughes, the operator at United Wireless, while annoyed, was also impressed with the teenager's skill and eventually offered him a job as a ship's wireless operator, at least in part to silence his 5KW spark. Vermilia eagerly accepted the offer, the beginning of a long career as both amateur and professional. This progression, driven by undamped enthusiasm, would become a pattern often repeated. Oh, and by the way, the opening statement that among preteens, mostly boys took to radio, some notable exceptions to come later, and demand for wireless supplies would all change over the next decade or so, and Bonnell would become a major advertiser in QST. Included in this material are quotes from the following. Irving Vermilia, amateur number one, QST, February 1917 and March 1917. Talk on wireless telegraphy, the New York Times, May 19, 1901. And Irving Vermilia, The BD Mystery, Radio Communications by the Amateurs, QST, April 1921. With thanks to W2PA, Chris Cadella, for his kind permission for the use of his website's materials, Ham Radio History, A Century of Amateur Radio, Ham's Organizations, Events, Inventions, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as an on-demand stream from Spotify, Deezer, and wherever podcasts are available. Hello and welcome to the DX Corner for your weekly dose of DX. I'm Bill, AJ8B. Oftentimes people will email me and ask if there's a written copy of the information that I discuss. There are so many call signs and URLs and dates being discussed, you could never remember them until such time as you could write them down. I use most of the same data that you hear in the DX Corner for the weekly DX column in the Ohio Section Journal. Just Google ARRL Ohio Section and you will find the Ohio section website. From there, you can subscribe to the weekly journal and get most of this information. The actual website is arrl-ohio.org. This is a free journal, and you don't need to be an ARRL member to receive it. And you'll get this DX information, but you won't get the wide variety of other information that's always included in This Week in Amateur Radio podcast. So here's what's happening in the world of DX. This section of DX News comes from Bernie, W3UR, editor of the Daily DX, the Weekly DX, and the How's DX column in QST. If you would like a free two-week trial of the Daily DX, your only source of real-time DX information, just drop me a note at thedxmentor at gmail.com. We have an update on N5J Jarvis Island. The much-anticipated Jarvis Island de-expedition is less than five weeks away. N5J will be on the air August 5th to the 17th. Two ribs, or ribs, uh, rigs in a box, and antenna tests have been conducted. One last week at Fox Whiskey 7, Juliet Victor on Wallace Island, and the second is occurring right now on America's Samoa as K8R. The local N5J team will consist of AA7JV, George, N1DJ, Don, HA7RY, Tomas, KN4EEI, Mike, and KO8SCA, Adrian. As an aside, Glenn, W0GJ, who is one of the FT8 operators, notes that this will be the first use of the new Super Fox mode. CY9C, the St. Paul Island de-expedition that I'll discuss in a minute, will be the second. The Jarvis Island de-expedition has many foundation, club, corporate, and individual sponsors. The Daily DX is proud to be one of the corporate sponsors of Jarvis Island. 3 Delta II Zulu Rotuma de-expedition adds a third youth operator. The 3D2Z Rotuma de-expedition team has added LY7J Lucas 
22 from Lithuania. He joins Connor, KD9 LSV, and Jamie, M0 SDV, as the team's third young ham, making three Delta II Zulu a multinational next generation de expedition. Lucas describes himself as a young ham with, quote, seven years of ham radio love. He is a second year electrical engineering student and a full time professional events photographer. Mike, W0 VTT, who stepped off of the in-person team, will remain a valued member of the off-island de-expedition team, serving as one of the remote operators of the two next-gen ribs, which will be accompanying the de-expedition. The St. Paul Island CY9C team has announced its VHF, UHF, EME satellite plans for the upcoming CY9C de-expedition. This de-expedition aims to provide excellent communication capabilities for amateur radio weak signal enthusiasts. Their VHF UHF plans include high power and optimized gain antennas for 6 and 2 meters, 70 and 23 centimeters, plus satellite and EME operation. As with previous de-expeditions, you can follow along in real time by joining the VHF-chat SLAT group. For more information about the CY9C de-expedition or to make a donation, visit the CY9C website or contact Murray, WA4DAN, via email. And we have a late-breaking update about the CY9 Charlie de-expedition that I'd like to share. The CY9C team is grateful to Flex Radio Incorporated for the loan of six complete Flex Radio station setups, which include a Flex 6600 transceiver, Maestro control head, and a Power Genius PGXL amplifier. A seventh Flex 6700 station will be used for VHF, UHF, EME, and satellite. Each station will have its own Honda EU2200 generator. There will be three operating teams whose schedule will slowly rotate through the gray line so everyone experiences all of the propagation. Half of the radios will be used for CW, sideband, and digital modes. At any given time, a minimum of three stations will be using the new SuperFox FT8 mode. All antennas will be monobanders with the exception of 12 and 17 meters, which will use a duo band beam with a diplexer. Each antenna will have a high powered bandpass filter. Flex radios were chosen for the maestro ergonomics and the ease of networking the radios, amplifiers, and computers with simple Cat5 cables. The amplifiers will all be, quote, remotely located together in the operations tent. This will make setup quick and simple without the complexity of, quote, all those wires in a wireless environment. Craig K9CT has assembled, labeled, and tested all of the stations. The first shipment of equipment will arrive in Dingwall, Nova Scotia, in just four weeks. The team will assemble in Dingwall on August 24th. Radio operations will start August 26th, weather permitting, and end on September 5th, again, weather permitting. Two helicopters will transport all the gear and operators to or from the island, making this the most expensive St. Paul Island operation ever. It has been a challenge to get the needed permits, insurance, and licensing. Getting permissions for these sensitive areas is becoming increasingly more difficult each year. This could well be the last CY9 St. Paul Island operation for many years to come. Your financial contributions will make this all possible. And as I've said before on this very uh, very podcast, if you're not sure you're interested in DX, you really got to keep an eye on certain things because, as they said, St. Paul may not be around for another 10 or 12 years. And if the DX bug finally bites you, uh, they're not going to be there to work. So, And if you're not sure how to get started or you need help, just drop me a note, thedxmentor at gmail.com. American Samoa K8K will be QRV through July 10th. YL2GM, Eurus, has been on American Samoa as K8K since June 28th using FT8. It was not possible to bring a spider beam due to luggage restrictions on Eurus flights to and from Lord Howe Island, where he operated as VK9LA. He made an unsuccessful effort to work 20 meter CW today. K8K will be on 80 meter for three nights, and then the 80 meter vertical will be transformed to 160 meters. So here's a few quick tidbits. KV1J Eric is traveling to St. Pierre and Miquelon Islands. He expects to be on the air as FP stroke KV1J July 2nd from Miquelon, initially on six meters. 
He hopes to put up a spider beam on July 3rd or 4th. Details of his trip are on his website. And again, that's KV1J. NL7RR Tom is heading back to Wake Island July 9th for a 14-day work assignment. It may take a day or two before he gets on the air as NL7RR stroke KH9 in his spare time. Listen for him on or near 14.220 MHz sideband between 0600 and 0930 Zulu, provided that he's not have to work overtime. We will be back with more from our DX mentor, Bill Sawyer's AJ8B, after we take this quick pause for stations along the network to identify. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Here's an update on Nui Island E6. JSEC SP5EAQ is planning a de-expedition from the same cottage used by E6SP and E6CI, which is located close to the ocean on a cliff north of Alafi. This is planned for October 22nd to November 9th, including the CQ Worldwide DX Single Sideband Contest. He has applied for the call sign E6AQ and is waiting for authorization. JSIC will be running a K3 and 600 watt amplifier. He will be on single sideband only using a 7 band GP7 vertical and delta loop or an L antenna for 80 meters. He plans to be on 80 through 10 meters. Once he knows the call sign has been issued, he will launch a website. QSOs will be updated daily to Club Log. You can QSL via SP7 DQR and uh, Logbook of the World a few weeks after the de expedition. And speaking of Logbook of the World, here's an update on Logbook of the World as of July 1st, 2024. Effective at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, we will be returning Logbook of the World to service. As work progressed on the network, some users encountered LOTW opening briefly during which some 6,600 logs were uploaded. The logs were not processed until this past weekend as we tested that the interfaces to LOTW were functioning properly. We are taking steps to help manage what will likely be a huge influx of logs. We are requesting that if you have large uploads, perhaps from contests or from a de-expedition, please wait a week or two before uploading to give LOTW a chance to catch up. We have also implemented a process to reject logs with excessive duplicates. Please do not upload your entire log to quote ensure your contacts are in LOTW as they will be rejected. Lastly, please do not call ARRL headquarters to report issues that you're having with LOTW. They want to hear from you, but you should use LOTW-help at ARRL.org. Throughout the end of the year, you may experience planned times when LOTW will be unavailable. We have been using this time to evaluate operational infrastructural improvements that we would like to make. Those times will be announced. We appreciate your patience as we work through the challenges keeping LOTW from returning to service. We know the importance of LOTW to our members and to the tens of thousands of LOTW users who are not ARL members. LOTW, just behind QST, is our second most popular ARRL benefit. And I'll tell you, I have been on it yesterday and today, and it appears to be faster than it used to be. Of course, that could be situational based on my local internet, but uh, it seems to be fast. I'll update this story uh, every chance we get uh, developments. We have an update on Bouvet Island. Yesterday, the 3Y0K Bouvet de Expedition team received the helicopter permit from Norwegian Polar Institute to make landings in the period between November 2025 to March 2026, reports Ken, LA7GIA. The permit will allow the team to, quote, set up camp at the plateau above Larsoya, southwest, with clear takeoff angles to North America and to the Southeast. The permit will give the 3Y0K team flexibility and gives them many options when planning the camp setup. So Ken is very persistent and this does seem to be moving forward, so good for him. So now I have a contest update. I know that the ARRL contest sheet is read elsewhere in this podcast and the contests that I mention are sometimes redundant. However, there are a few contests that I have found to be especially useful for DXers who are trying to fill band slots or to get entities or zones in the log that may otherwise be difficult to get. 
Radio sport fans are gearing up for the summer's biggest HF competition, the IARU HF World Championship. This 24-hour long contest is the highlight of the summer HF contesting season with plenty of opportunity to work DX from all around the globe on CW and sideband. Participants also get the chance to make QSOs with many IARU member society club stations and officials. The IARU HF Championship is one of Radio Sport's more unique events, said the ARL Contest Branch Manager. It's the only major contest that uses ITU zones as part of the exchange and the only contest that gives special multiplier status for IARU member society stations and their officials. Hams can get on the fun in a variety of ways. You may choose to enter as either a single operator using either sideband only, CW only, or a mixture of both modes. Single operator stations can choose from three power levels, high power, which is greater than 150 watts, low power, which is between 5 and 150, and QRP, which is 5 watts or less. You can also get some friends together at one station and participate as a multi-operator station with a single transceiver. One of the fun things to do is to see how many of the IARU special stations you can work during the event. While most stations give their ITU zone as part of the contest exchange, IARU member society stations give the abbreviation for their IARU society name, such as ARRL for W1AW, the contest manager explained. In addition, IARU officials can give one of four unique exchanges, AC if they are on the administrative council, or R1, R2, or R3 for the ITU region that the official serves. It is always special to see so many nations represented on the air by their national organizations. It reinforces the global nature of amateur radio and the common bonds that we all have as amateurs, end quote. The ARRL HQ station, W1AW Stroke 4, will be on the air from Tennessee, operated by members of the Tennessee Contest Group, and the IARU HQ station, NU1AW, will be on the air from Missouri. The IARU HF World Championship begins at 1200 UTC Saturday, July 13th, and goes until 1200 UTC Sunday, July 14th. Complete rules may be found online. All logs must be emailed or postmarked no later than 1200 UC, UTC, August 14th. The latest episode of the DX Mentor has been posted and is now available wherever you get your podcasts and on the DX Mentor YouTube channel. The discussion this week is with K4SWL Thomas and is focused on the Parks on the Air program versus DX. It is lively and spirited, I can assure you. Um, in a week or two weeks from now, uh, we will be dropping a, a episode of the DX Mentor where we're talking to Ned, AA7A. Ned is one of the architects and experts with FT8. In fact, he's the guy that coined the foxhound term and had a lot to do with the brand new Super Fox that's coming out. You won't want to miss that if you're interested in FT8. Until next week, this is Bill, AJB, saying 7-3. And I hope to see you in the pileups. The International Amateur Radio Union HF World Championship occurs next weekend, beginning at 1200 UTC on Saturday, July the 13th, and concluding at 1159 UTC on Sunday, July 14th. AWRL Contest Program Manager Paul Borquet, N1SFE, reminds participants they can enter in CW, single sideband, or mixed mode categories. The exchange is a signal report and your ITU zone. ITU zones for stations in the lower 48 are 6, 7, or 8. ITU zones for Canadian stations are 2, 3, 4, or 9. U.S. and Canadian participants should visit the rules page for more information on how to determine your ITU zone. In addition, Stations operated by members of the IARU Administrative Council, three IARU Regional Executive Committees, and IARU Member Society HQ stations from around the globe will be on the air. HQ stations will send their member society abbreviations. AWRL Headquarters Station W1AW-4 will be on the air from Tennessee, operated by members of the Tennessee Contest Group, and IARU HQ station NU1AW will be on the air from Missouri. Participants are reminded that self-spotting is strictly prohibited in all categories. 
For full rules and more information, visit www.awrl.org forward slash IARU dash HF dash world dash championship. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available to download as a podcast from anywhere on the web. Podcasts are available. Foundations of Amateur Radio Over the past week, I've been attempting to work out what the IARU, the International Amateur Radio Union, actually does and how it works. I started looking into this because the IARU is this year celebrating a century since its foundation in 1925. You might think of the IARU as one organisation, but behind the scenes there are actually four one for each so-called region, as well as a global organisation called the International Secretariat, headquartered at the ARRL in Connecticut. The regions have been negotiated by members of the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. As early as 1927, the ITU documented differences in frequency allocations between Europe and other regions. In Cairo, in 1938, it defined boundaries for Europe, In Atlantic City, in 1947, the ITU defined three regions with specific boundaries, essentially Europe and Africa, the Americas, and the rest of the world. As a surprise to nobody, this is purely a political decision, especially since radio waves don't get to have a passport and pass border control. The impact of this continues today, generations later. We still have this patchwork of frequency allocations, we still have exclusions, different band edges, and other anachronisms. The regions are further divided into zones. When you start looking at the ITU zone map in detail, it gets weird. For example, Iraq is in Region 1. Neighbouring Iran has been specifically excluded from Region 1 and moved to Region 3. In case you're curious, Iran has been represented at the ITU since 1938. Antarctica is part of seven of the 90 ITU zones, and all three regions, because of course it is. Zone 90, jammed between zones 35, 45, 61, 64, 65 and 76, almost as an afterthought, contains one landmass, Minamatorishima. An island that sticks 9 metres above the water, has a 6 kilometre coastline, and is generally off-limits to the general public. The nearest land in any direction is over a 1,000 kilometres away. It's got an IOTA, Islands on the Air, designation Oscar Charlie 073, and despite its isolation, has been activated by radio amateurs using Juliet Delta 1 prefix callsigns. I live in Australia, ITU Zone 58, part of Region 3, together with the two most populous countries on the planet, India and China, and the rest of Eastern Asia, but not the former Soviet republics, and most but not all of Oceania. You know, because logic. From a population perspective, Region 3 is the largest by several orders of magnitude, but you'd never know it if you went looking. Why am I telling you all this? Well... That's the international stage on which the IARU is representing amateur radio. In 1927, the underlying assumption was that each service, amateur radio included, had a global exclusive allocation. The reality was different. Spectrum was in such short supply that individual exceptions were carved out, which, as I've said, resulted in splitting up the world into regions, starting in 1938 and codified in 1947. The IARU in 1925 is a different organisation from what it is today. In 1925, individual amateurs could become members. As soon as enough members from a country joined, they'd be grouped together. When there were enough groups, the IARU became a federation of national associations. Over time, the IARU as a single body evolved into the structure we have today. In 1950, in Paris, the IARU Region 1 organisation was formed. 
In 1964, in Mexico City, IARU Region 2 was created, and in 1968, in Sydney, IARU Region 3 came to exist. You can see their online presence at the various IARU.org websites. How it works is no clearer now than it was when I started. What it has achieved is equally unclear. I'm currently trolling through ITU World Radio Communications conference documentation going back to 1903 to discover references to amateur radio, but it's hard going. At least it's something. The IARU documentation is not nearly as extensive or up-to-date. It appears that many, if not all, of the people working behind the scenes at the various IARU organisations are volunteers. If you feel inclined, there's an ongoing request for assistance. And before you ask, yes, I looked into helping out, but that will have to wait until funds permit. If you have insights into the functioning of the IARU, don't be shy. Get in touch. CQ at vk6flab.com is my address. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. Bruce Page KK5DO is here now with this week's AMSAT report. Bruce? Thanks, John. As a beginner, when you start working the satellites, you might not have a full duplex radio. You may only have one dual band HD. How do you know if you're making the satellite? We have all been told do not transmit on the satellites unless you can hear yourself. Here is what I used to do when operating with a dual band HT. I would listen to the pass for a minute or so and write down call signs that I hear. I then pick a moment when there seems to be a pause and I call one of those stations. If they come back to you, they will say your call and their grid square and their call again. It is now your turn to give their call, your grid square, and then your call. There you have a contact. Were you heard on the satellite? Of course, as the station you called came back to you. If you simply give your call sign, you take a shot at will someone come back to you or not. That does not tell you if you made it into the satellite. So what happens if the station you called does not come back to you? You can try adjusting your uplink frequency by one step and repeat the process, or try calling someone else. Usually on an FM satellite, the uplink is not as critical as it would be on a linear satellite. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. Back to you, John. And thanks, Bruce, for that report. It is time for the weekly propagation forecast, brought to us by Tad Cook, K2RA in Seattle, Washington. This week, solar activity increased, and the average daily sunspot number reported in last week's bulletin will be higher than last week's number. On Friday, June 28, a coronal mass ejection caused a severe G4-class geomagnetic storm. Middle Latitude A index was 32 and Planetary A index was 59, much higher than Alaska's College A index of 36. Spaceweather.com reports that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration says G1 geomagnetic storms are possible this week because of yet another coronal mass ejection. So looking ahead for the near term, the predicted solar flux is 160 on July 5, 155 on July 6 through the 9th, 180 on July 10, 170 on July 11 through the 13th, and 180 on July 14. Looking at the predicted planetary A index for the near term, it will be 5 on July 6th through the 7th, 12 on July 8th through the 9th, 5 on July 10th through July 13th, then 10, 10, and 8 on July 14th though the 16th. Just ahead in Radio Sport this coming week, on July 5th, it's the weekly RIDI test, that's digital. On July 6th, the Venezuelan Independence Day contest, CW phone and digital. July 6th and 7th, the NZART Memorial Contest, that's CW and phone. July 7th, the TAVHF UHF contest, CW phone. On July 6th and 7th, it's the Marconi Memorial HF contest, that's CW. Also on July 6th and 7th, the original QRP contest, CW Phone, and the PODXS 070 Club 40-meter firecracker sprint, that is digital. And on July 9th, it's the Worldwide Sideband Activity Contest, and that's Phone. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a stream to your favorite digital device on Spotify, TuneIn.com, Overcast, iHeartMedia, and wherever you download your podcasts.
It is time for AMSAT satellite shorts from all over. This week we start with China's Chang'e 6 probe returning to Earth on June 25, 2024, with the first ever samples from the far side of the moon, landing in Inner Mongolia on Tuesday. The successful mission marks a global milestone, with the samples expected to include 2.5 million year old volcanic rock that could shed light on the geological differences between the moon's near and far sides. The probe landed in the moon's South Pole Aitken Basin, providing samples from various geological layers. This mission is part of China's growing space rivalry with the U.S. and other nations, aiming to establish China as a technological power. The journey began on May 3rd and lasted 53 days, involving drilling into the core and collecting surface rocks. China plans to share the samples with international scientists, hoping to answer fundamental questions about lunar geology and the solar system's early days. Next up comes word that NASA called off a planned spacewalk on June 24th due to a malfunction in astronaut Tracy Dyson's spacesuit. Dyson and her crewmate, Mike Barat, were preparing to exit the International Space Station to conduct maintenance when a water leak was detected in Dyson's suit cooling unit. This unit is crucial for maintaining a comfortable temperature during spacewalks. The leak occurred just after the suits were switched to battery power, prompting NASA to abort the mission. Although Dyson reported feeling a bit warm and expressed concerns about potential water damage to electrical connectors, both astronauts were safe throughout the incident. This cancellation follows a similar recent setback on June 13th involving a spacesuit issue, and it raises questions about the potential impact on the return schedule of Boeing's Starliner capsule. And finally, on AMSAT News Shorts, NASA astronauts Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore, who flew Boeing's Starliner capsule to the International Space Station, have had their return to Earth delayed multiple times due to issues with the spacecraft. Originally planned to stay for about a week, their mission has been extended indefinitely as NASA and Boeing investigate a slow helium leak and malfunctioning thrusters discovered after reaching orbit. The latest delay was announced last week, with no new return date set yet. Despite these issues, the astronauts are assisting with tasks and conducting tests on the ISS where they are accommodated with sufficient supplies. NASA is taking a cautious approach, allowing data to drive decisions about managing the leaks and thruster performance. This mission aims to certify the Starliner for future routine flights, similar to SpaceX's Crew Dragon service for NASA. The U.S. Congress may soon require AM radio in new cars. In a published response, vehicle manufacturers claim they might have to drop safety features instead. That's the message from opponents of the proposed law in Congress. A guest commentary published by Automotive News restates the key points that opponents have been making since the legislation was introduced, but their blunt emphasis on a possible trade-off with important safety features seems notable. To accommodate analog AM radio as a primary design requirement, certain car makers may need to scrap advanced safety features with engineers having to prioritize outdated technology over current or future safety innovations, they wrote. If the goal is to save American lives, Congress should encourage automakers to focus on innovative technologies like advanced driver assistance systems, autonomous vehicles, and collision avoidance systems that actually reduce car accidents and fatalities, they wrote. They did not provide specifics of how much AM would cost to keep in comparison to such features. The Youth on the Air, or Yoda Camp Ham Shack, has been renamed the Bob Heil K9EID Memorial Yoda Camp Amateur Radio Shack. With more details on this story, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, reporting from League Headquarters. The Youth on the Air Yoda Camp Ham Shack has been renamed the Bob Heil K9EID Memorial Yoda Camp Amateur Radio Shack. Heil 83 passed away on February 28, 2024. He was considered the man who defined the sound of live rock and roll music and brought audio engineering principles into mainstream amateur radio use. He founded Heil Sound in 1966, through which he created the template for modern concert sound systems for musicians like the Grateful Dead, The Who, Joe Walsh, and Peter Frampton. 
Kyle was also known as a mentor and generous donor to amateur radio organizations who enjoyed helping others find success in ham radio and supported youth on the air from the very beginning. Camp Director Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, said that when the camp first started, he asked Kyle for some equipment. Bob sent us the radios we needed right away, said Rapp. And when I asked for some additional help with all of the noise in the ham shack, Kyle responded, Have I ever said no to you before? And sent the group six headsets. Rapp said he got the idea to rename the shack at the Dayton Hamvention, but left the final decision up to the Yoda kids, and it didn't take long, and there was never any question that it was the right thing to do, Rapp added. The 2024 Youth on the Air Summer Camp in the Americas will be held July 7th through the 12th at Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. The first activation of VE-1 Yoda call sign from the camp will begin the evening of Sunday, July 7th, and concludes on Friday, July 12th. Campers will operate the Ohio Memorial Station as they finish projects between sessions and during free time. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. The 2024 Yoda Americas Camp is hosted by Radio Amateurs of Canada. Campers are also scheduled for a contact with the International Space Station and will be activating a number of POTA locations, including the Georges Island National Historic Site on Thursday, July 11th. Don't miss a moment of the excitement on the Youth on the Air YouTube channel and meanwhile, be listening for VE1YOTA. Special QSL cards will be available for contacts made with Yodacamp from the Bob Heil K9EID Memorial Yodacamp Amateur Radio Shack. June 25th, a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket successfully lifted off from Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A at 5.26 p.m. Eastern, carrying the GOES-U weather satellite, the final spacecraft in a series of geostationary weather satellites. This launch featured several notable firsts overcoming previous weather forecasts that had predicted only a 30% chance of favorable conditions. The GOES-U satellite successfully deployed from the Falcon Heavy's second stage four and a half hours after liftoff after the stage completed a sequence of three burns to place the satellite into a geostationary transfer orbit. Built by Lockheed Martin for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, GOES-U will be renamed GOES-19 upon reaching geostationary orbit. After on-orbit commissioning, it will be positioned at 75 degrees east in geostationary orbit, taking over from GOES-16 as the operational GOES-East satellite. GOES-U carries a suite of Earth and space science instruments similar to its predecessors but includes the new compact coronagraph instrument for solar observation. CCOR will monitor the solar corona for flares and coronal mass ejections, a crucial function for understanding space weather. This role was previously filled by the nearly 30-year-old Solar and Heliospheric Observatory spacecraft. NOAA is already planning the next generation of geostationary weather satellites, called GOXO, set to begin launching in 2032. The GOES-U launch marked the 10th overall for the Falcon Heavy and the second contracted by NASA following the Psyche asteroid mission in October 2023. Another Falcon Heavy is set to launch NASA's Europa Clipper mission this October, continuing SpaceX's role in advancing space exploration and weather monitoring capabilities. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. NASA will have a spacecraft from Elon Musk's SpaceX guide the International Space Station's destruction later this decade, the agency announced Wednesday. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration awarded an $843 million contract to SpaceX to build the so-called U.S. deorbit vehicle. The spacecraft will be designed to guide the football field-sized research laboratory back into the Earth's atmosphere after retiring in 2030. 
The SpaceX-built vehicle will effectively destroy the ISS by pushing the station into re-entry from orbit. It is crucial to prepare for the safe and responsible deorbit of the International Space Station in a controlled manner, NASA said in a press release, with the U.S. deorbit vehicle needed to ensure avoidance of risk to populated areas. NASA did not specify whether SpaceX's design for the U.S. deorbit vehicle will be based on one of the company's existing spacecraft, such as its Dragon capsules. But the ISS is aging, with NASA and its lead partner, Roscosmos, unable to solve a worsening problem of microscopic leaks on the station. NASA published a study on Wednesday with analysis of why it decided to intentionally destroy the ISS in a controlled re-entry. The agency evaluated a variety of alternatives, including disassembling the station in orbit or trying to raise the ISS to a higher orbit with a large spacecraft like SpaceX's Starship. The space station is a unique artifact whose historical value cannot be overstated. NASA considered this when determining if any part of the station could be salvaged for historical preservation or technical analysis, the agency wrote. Ultimately, the agency study determined that any attempts to preserve or reuse the ISS were technically or economically infeasible. NASA noted the possibility the ISS's operational lifetime could be extended beyond 2030, but that is yet to be determined and requires agreement with its international partner agencies. NASA is planning to replace the ISS through private space stations and is helping fund the U.S. company's development through the Commercial Low Earth Orbit Destinations Program. Firefly Aerospace's Alpha Rocket originally scheduled for launch on June 27th, has been rescheduled to 9.03 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time on July 1st for its mission titled Noise of Summer. This launch will occur from Space Launch Complex 2 at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, carrying NASA payloads and involving a dedicated launch team. For updates closer to the launch window, visit Firefly Aerospace's official website at https fireflyspace.com forward slash news. A highlight of this launch is the Elena 43 mission, featuring the deployment of multiple CubeSats, including the University of Maine's MESIT-1. This satellite, equipped with a linear transponder module from AMSAT, will help conduct experiments designed by Maine schools, contributing to educational and research objectives supported by NASA. The Noise of Summer mission will deploy a total of eight CubeSats using Firefly Aerospace's Alpha rocket. Alongside MESIT-1, these CubeSats include CATSAT from the University of Arizona, CubeSat-1 from the University of Kansas, R5-S4 and R5-S2 2.0 from NASA's Johnson Space Center, Serenity from Teachers in Space, SOCI from the University of Washington, and TechEdSat-11 from NASA's Ames Research Center. The live-streamed launch, in collaboration with NASA Spaceflight, will provide viewers with insights into the intricate operations involved. MESAT-1, beyond its primary mission objectives, will study local temperatures and phytoplankton concentrations using onboard sensors and imaging equipment. It also features a linear transponder for amateur radio use, with telemetry accessible through AMSAT's Fox Talon program, allowing enthusiasts to decode and analyze satellite data. Educational experiments aboard MESET-1, such as Albedo, Imager, and HAB, developed by Maine schools, aim to study light reflection, coastal water turbidity, and early detection of harmful algae blooms, respectively. These projects highlight the collaborative effort between educational institutions and space agencies to promote scientific learning and environmental awareness. Managed under NASA's CubeSat Launch Initiative and sponsored by the Maine Space Giant Consortium, MESIT-1 represents a significant milestone as Maine's first small satellite. It will enter a sun-synchronous orbit, facilitating long-term data collection for climate and environmental studies. AMSAT's involvement in the mission underscores its role in advancing amateur radio satellite technology and promoting international cooperation in space science. Through initiatives like Fox Telem, AMSAT enables public engagement with satellite telemetry, thereby enhancing participation in space exploration 
and scientific discovery. Communications companies subject to new federal Internet service regulations want a court to block them from taking effect next month to avoid irreparable injury to their financial operations, the company said in a filing Friday. National and regional Internet service providers have challenged net neutrality rules adopted in April by the Federal Communications Commission under Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel, saying the rules, if allowed, would exceed the agency's legal authority and inflict unrecoverable losses. In a brief this week, the ISPs pointed to the FCC's creation of a general conduct standard, which they said the agency can enforce with massive forfeitures and private parties with damages actions. The FCC's rules classified ISPs as common carriers under Title II of the Communications Act, giving the agency a strong supervisory role over the firms that connect 91% of U.S. households to the Internet. The FCC used its authority to waive certain rules to lessen the full brunt of Title II, noting that it would not regulate rates or require ISPs to open their networks to third-party ISPs. In their brief, the ISPs claimed the FCC was downplaying the full weight of the rules. The FCC pretends that the net neutrality order merely imposes uncontroversial open Internet rules, emphasizing that it has foreborne from some of Title II's most eye-popping provisions, the ISP said. That the FCC needs to forbear from so much of Title II to make its interpretation work is a sign that the FCC has the wrong interpretation. The ISPs, companies such as Comcast, Charter, AT&T, and Verizon, represented by national and state trade associations, also insisted a stay was needed because Congress did not expressly authorize the FCC's action. The ISPs have asked the court to rule on the stay by July 15th, one week before the rules take effect on July 22nd. That would leave a short period of time to seek a stay from the Supreme Court if a stay were denied below. The FCC and ISPs have also disagreed as to the correct judicial venue. After the Sixth Circuit was chosen to hear the case by lottery, the FCC moved to transfer the case to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit in Washington, located close to FCC headquarters. The FCC claimed the D.C. Circuit should take the case because that court ruled in four previous net neutrality cases. The ISPs have opposed the transfer, asserting the FCC was looking to gain an edge because the D.C. Circuit upheld the agency's 2015 net neutrality rules. The special event call sign SN91LOT is on the air this month to mark the tragic deaths of two pioneering Lithuanian-American aviators. The 91 in the call sign notes that 91 years have passed since their doomed transatlantic crossing. In July of 1933, two Lithuanian-American aviators successfully crossed the Atlantic Ocean in a small airplane from New York, bound for what was then the capital city of Lithuania. On July 17th, two days after their departure, the plane, known as the Lithuanica, crashed 650 kilometers short of that destination. The wreckage was found in eastern Germany. The pilots, Stephanus Darius and Stasius Gerenus, did not survive. According to several websites, it was never clear what caused the crash. This year, as in previous years, a special call sign is on the air to the end of July to commemorate the aviator's doomed effort. Be listening to the HF bands and you can QSL via SP1 PMY. This week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to 
W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. And finally this week, in the United Kingdom, the International Amateur Radio Union HF Championship Contest has become two events in one this year. The larger event is the global competition being run by the AWRL on the 13th and 14th of July. The more local event is a new awards program known as the GR2 HQ Challenge administered by the Radio Society of Great Britain. GR2 HQ is the RSGB's headquarters station participating in the contest, and it comprises a dozen or so stations on the air throughout the UK and on its islands. The RSGB is encouraging individuals and clubs to work the GR2 HQ stations in as many bands and modes as possible. This serves two purposes. It introduces a special challenge accessible to even non-contesters, and it helps boost the RSGB standing in the Global HF Championship. According to the press release, the Society Station was placed third last year, and it is hoping for an even better score this time around. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD Repeater System, on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. Many of the news and information items heard in this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the Shortwave Listening Post, the Federal Communications Commission, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the International Telecommunications Union, the 425DX News, Parks on the Air, and the Soda Reflector, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service, at our website at twiar.net. And now, for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio Headquarters and our news team around the world, this is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF, wishing you a 73.